people that aren't parents even, or they weren't taking care of their own kids, but were taking care of other people's kids. Oh, we down a little bit, Jeff. This is just too much for me. Um, and in it, I mean, there was this whole crew, and you saw some of them, but from adults all the way through the teens that were helping out. And then, of course, a lot of the kids get the whole picture of it, and they were helping each other out as they looked this week. And I don't know if it's going to be mentioned later or not, but um, their theme this week was this God is good, you know, as we talked about. And there are different stages they went through. The first night was when life is scary, God is good. Second night, when life is unfair, God is good. When life changes, God is good. When life is sad, God is still good. And the last one, when life is good, God is good. And the funny thing is that this last week in guys group, we meet on Monday night, several of us, and it's open if any of you would want to come. And it's not, we, although we have a lesson, it's not specifically pointed just only to that, and it's not just another Bible study, it's a life study. And as we look at the Bible, life comes out, and hopefully that's what happens each week. As we look at it, we begin to understand a little bit of life. But one of the things that um, got brought up this week was uh, I mentioned and we talked about how do we get this relationship, and it's about worship with God and how it shouldn't just be on Sundays. It shouldn't just be those sudden moments that we have or in crises, but it ought to be really all the time. That's his desire is that we would worship him all the time. And you say, but man, doesn't that get monotonous? No, man. I mean, it's a relationship. And for those that are here today, and I had written down here in my notes that um, it's Father's Day, and sadly, it's the best of times and it's the worst of times because it reminds people of things. And some of you that it reminds you of bad dads, and I'm sorry um, at the same time, I want you to know that that doesn't mean you have to be. Others, it was absent dads, dads that were just never around. Others had abusive. And uh, some have those dads that have passed on, and so this might be your first time of going through a Father's Day without him. And so in that regard, there's a variety of things that happen. And uh, yet at the same time, we have those dads that are here that may have lost children, which is one of the most difficult things anybody could do. But with that in mind, sometimes we only worship God when things are good. And we do it from a distance because things are going fine with me. I don't need to be, you know, go to church to worship God or anything else. Thank you, God. And we say our prayers in the morning. We say them at night. And maybe you even say them with your kids, which I encourage you. I mean, some of you wish my dad and mom hadn't taught me so much about praying because that's why I pray so long sometimes. Because, I mean, I get used to just talking to God. And it's not because I'm a super Christian. It's just that's what he wants, and it's developed over time. But I was talking to the guys, and I said, well, the sad thing is walking with Christ is kind of a development thing. And I said, quite honestly, and guys can talk about this, but uh, because sometimes wives, we don't talk about you specifically. We just talk about generally, you know, and the differences with guys and girls and stuff. But I said, you know, how many of us really would have gotten married if we didn't think there was some kind of a payday on the other side of it? And uh, meaning, you know, there's okay, I'm attracted, and we correlated love with this feeling that we get. Oh, man, and, and, and I know guys don't talk about goosebumps very often, but girls have a certain way of doing that, or there can be this ooey-gooey, tingly thing that happens when you pee your stomach every time you see her. It's like, whoa, and you find yourself writing little notes, and at least this was back in old high school. Um, you'd write each other notes, you know, and leave them here or there, or try to pass them through class, and and so today, I'm sure it's just text and this and that, and, and I don't even understand how some are dating when they're in sixth grade, but they're dating, you know, and so, but how that goes, and you begin to correlate love with what? This feeling, and it's energizing, and it really is, endorphins release, they tell us, and all this other stuff, but you know, I mean, it builds up in you, and it's like, wow, you're really attracted, and then you want to be able to not only spend as much time as you can with that person, even if it's just five minutes or maybe two minutes out of your five minutes, you got to go from one class to another, But lunch hours and this and that, and on one hand, time seems to stand still, and the other time, it seems to just fly by, and that's what love is. Well, we're kind of that way with God. We have this tendency to think that God's loving when we feel good, or when we see him give us that parking place, or when we did lose that 10th pound finally, or when we were able to, or we see him coming through in a prayer that we had for him in a miraculous way. Or just the everyday, or that close miss, man, that I've had plenty of them with what I should have been dead and I'm not, but if it had been this much closer, I wouldn't have made it. And so we have this tendency to love God when we see Him working and when we feel Him, and then when we don't, we kind of just leave Him out there. And it's not that we don't care, it's just God doesn't need me, right? And technically, no, I am more trouble than I am worth, but God wants me. 
And the funny thing is that he wants me to love him, but then he wants me to show that love for him, not only by talking with him, but then by acting on his behalf. And that's what the essence of Christianity is. It's that we receive Christ and that he paid for our sins, but he didn't just pay for them, he freed us from them. And then that with this freedom that we've got, now we go about spending the rest of our life, at least for me, I've still not got it down yet, but changing from Steve Pettit, son of Dennis, to Steve Pettit, son of God. And that's what you ought to be doing is becoming, and it's not less human, it's actually becoming more godly. And then the next thing you know, you begin to see that God is good no matter what's going on, you want to spend the time with him. So my phrase for that was, oh, when you only like God when he feels good, is it's kind of like lusting after God. But love, has, it's in spite of. It's no matter what. It's what true dads have for their kids. You don't love them because they always make you feel good. Now, if there's one of you here that has, maybe you just got a newborn or something that way, but if one of you here has had kids that just always made you feel so good, let me know. Because usually I talk to parents, and it's like they just want to spend money, man. And I'm the ATM. They just keep coming to me for more and more money. And so our kids don't always make us feel good, but, man... The true dads love them and would die for them and do by the way that they live. And in their love for their kids, they continue to try to provide what they need, not just what they want. And it's this balance that that's what real love is with God is we don't just love him because he makes us feel good. He's an ATM. He gives us our, ma- our wishes when we read our five Bible verses for the day or whatever. No, man, we love God because we've learned he's always there. Now, using that and going back to where I was there, talking about this idea of with God and and the way that we can begin here on Father's Day, the whole point being is, is that on Father's Day, obviously there's a correlation with our immediate dads. Taking this United States holiday, at least, and transferring it into being a spiritual thing at that, where we don't just thank our dads for being our dads, we thank God for giving us dads. And we don't just thank God for giving us dads, but we thank God that through our dads, we begin to understand what our Father in heaven is like. And again, I recognize some of you haven't had the best examples of that. But you know the coolest thing is? It doesn't keep you from changing it. You can be that starting point from this point on where generation after generation after generation is changed because of you deciding, I'm going to be the dad I wish my dad would have been. And I'm going to be the dad that if my son follows in my footsteps, that he will know what to do with his kids. And it's in that regard that we best portray and we understand and begin to experience what a real relationship with God is like. It's when it's good and it's when it's bad. It's when it's sad. It's when it's unfair. It doesn't make any difference. You know that he's there. If you will, let's pray. God, today, I don't want to just share my words. And Lord, I'm more nervous than the kids were that stood up here. And I got to the point after 40 years that, God, it's good. I'd never want to take for granted standing here in this spot that, uh, oh, I know what to do. And, God, I don't want to get up here without you. And I don't want to get up here without your spirit. And I don't want it to be my words. And I don't want to impress. I just want to, Lord, let people be impressed with you. And this crazy book or the Bible that's... uh, parts I mean, all of it's at least 2,000 years old, you know, but uh, parts of it older than that. And how it still is relevant. But then how, Lord Jesus, when you were on the earth, it got to the point that they saw you as being the same as the word and you were known as that. And that we can count on your word, that you're honorable. You'll do what you said that you would do. And so today I ask, Lord, that you said I could ask anything in your name and it would be given to me and my prayer is simple. It's just, would you speak through me? Not just um, keep me from falling, But so that, Lord, everybody that's here today that would like to hear something from heaven would know it's not me, it's not Steve, but it's you, God. And whether that's in an encouragement, whether that's in uh, sympathetic sadness, or whether that's in, Lord, uh, being able to be more optimistic, I don't care where it's at in there, Lord, or whether it's just the next step to do, or whether it's just to have peace wherever we are. God, I pray that you would speak through me in your word today. And even as we look at this story that's, Lord, thousands of years old with David, might we learn from it that, God, you never change. And really, we sadly don't change as much as we could. But there are principles if we apply that, God, it will make our end good as we would greet you and know that we honored you 
even as you've asked us to honor our parents. In Jesus' name, amen. So with that in mind, if you will, take your Bibles if you got it. If not, we've got it on the screen up here. But I want to go back to a passage that's often used. And it's not using it just for Father's Day. But I want you to see something that the Lord said in here. In Ephesians chapter 6, please. Ephesians chapter 6. And it's here in this book that Paul's writing to the Ephesian church. And the Ephesian church, we've got a lot of info on. Won't go into all that. But they were even included in the book of Revelation, mentioned specifically and by name. And so Paul's telling these Christians, much like all of us have to learn, and I'm still learning, and that is that you begin your life in Christ and you're automatically a part of the family of God. When you fully accept Christ on his terms, not just yours, that he's there. And he promises not only to be with you forever in this life, but in the eternal life that's yet to come. And then it's a matter of growing up. It's not any different than being born. We're born. We don't know much. In fact, we don't know anything but how to suck and cry, and we do a pretty good job at it. We keep living, right? And that's the amazing thing about it is you cry when you're hungry, you cry when you're displeased, you cry when you're wet, or whatever else it may be. And parents come running. And so in our early stages of Christianity, we see God kind of as that way. He comes running whenever we cry, and he does. But then as we get older, he begins to go ahead and say, if you don't quit crying, I'll give you something to cry about. Or that's what my dad's famous words were, you know. And you begin to understand what that means is that don't misuse this. Don't think you're going to manipulate me just because you put on the crocodile tears. But rather instead, you know, you've got responsibilities and they start teaching you that you're part of the family and everything in that regard. That's what God's doing. And that's what Paul's writing here. He's teaching the family. Here's what it is to be a part of the family of God. That it's not just this, well, I'm saved, now I don't have to do anything else. No, it's now that I'm saved, what do I do with it? What did he save me for or to do? And how do I use that or share that with other people? And in the midst of it, he gives practical advice. He just got done talking about husbands and wives. Now he's going to talk to children. He said, children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Now, that sounds like something a parent would write, doesn't it? You know, golly, yeah. And I remember hearing that as a kid growing up, and not so much my mom and dad, but at church and stuff that was enforced to us that you're supposed to do this. And what was implied was, or God will get you. Anybody get that feeling? <laughs> you know, you either do this or God will get you. And, and it's not so much God will get you, it's just that you'll be on your own. And that's it. It's a choice. We either serve God because we want to, or we're on our own. And the presence of God's a great place to be through the good times and the bad times. But he says, children, obey your parents and the Lord, for this is right. And then he ups it, not just obey them, do what they tell you to do. But he really, this is the most important part, I think, is honor your father and your mother, which is the first commandment with a promise. And he gives it his twist on it. And I don't mean this like it's a twisted or not true. But Paul says, In other words, that it may go well with you and that you may enjoy long life on the earth. Now, I'm not going to quit because it does say fathers don't exasperate your children, meaning don't become their slave driver. It's not designed in that regard. But it doesn't mean that as kids that we don't have responsibilities around the house to serve. That's a part of living. And when we as kids don't learn how to serve, we don't do a very good job as adults serving. And yet there really is a joy in serving. Now, I don't want to just leave it there. Let's go back and see where this originated back in the book of Exodus. And that's back in the Ten Commandment days, you know, and that's one of the commandments that was included. And I just want you to see what God says back here. So if you will, Exodus chapter 20, and let's pick up with verse 4. Could start at the beginning, but I'll try and do for time just to kind of condense it here a little bit. In verse 4, and you go, what's this got to do with it? Just hang on with me. You shall not make for yourself an idol in the form of anything in heaven above, on the earth beneath, or the waters below. In other words, don't try to, God says, don't try to make something that would emulate me. Don't get something that you would worship, because that's what you'll end up doing is worshiping the thing. Um, Much is dealt with in that, but idolatry is also anything that we put before God. If you're a believer, it's whatever you put at the top of your list. And that's a tough call, isn't it? It's as tough as what it is if you're a dad which is more important, your wife or your kids? Well, it's a lot easier to love your kids because you can at least excuse them. But God says, no, your wife's more important. That's why he told us we had to love her because we naturally love our kids. We don't naturally love our wives. And I don't mean that bad about any of our wives. I'm just saying he calls us into responsibility and we're called to do that. But the thing is, he understands the sequence. If he's here the Father, Son, the Holy Spirit, and the Word of God, and then us as, as dads or men, and then our wives, then our kids. 
if it's in that order, that the greatest thing that any dad can do is to love their kid's mother. Why? Because it begins to establish and show what this honor is about and what marriage should be, not just what people think it is or what Hollywood likes to try to present it as. That it's not about just this lovey, ooey-gooey feeling. No, it's about a determined decision to make up your mind. And when you love and you give of yourself, you find that in, in time it comes back in ways that you couldn't believe. So God says that we should love our wives more. Here in idolatry, he's just saying, love me the most. Don't try to put a picture of me. Now, time out here just aside. The coolest thing is we're always told not to do any of this imagery, no idols, no carved images or whatever. And isn't it ironic that Jesus lived the 33 years he was here, three and a half years of ministry, doing all these great things, and nobody painted a picture of him? Nobody did a chalk sketch of him? We don't have one thing that we have physically to look at to know what Jesus looked like. Thank you, God. You know why? Because we'd worship it. But you know what he did say, even after all these years of saying, don't, don't make any idols, he did say after Christ comes into you, he said, now you, you are the image of Christ. Each of us, and especially all of us together, became, become this mosaic that portrays what Jesus really looks like. That's what he was waiting for all along. Don't make a graven image because I'm going to put you, I'm going to get into your heart. I'm going to make you my image. Isn't that unreal? Not that any of us would be worshipped, especially pastors. It should be that we begin to show what God's like as we serve other people, not just the church, but other people. So anyway, after saying all this about the idolatry, I want you to see what he says. In verse 5, he said, You shall not bow down to them, worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing children. Now, here's what he says. This idolatry is going to be harmful to you, and what it brings about is the curse. Punishing children for the sin of their fathers to the third and the fourth generation. But don't quit reading. He said, That's for those that hate me. But showing love to a thousand generations of those that love me and keep my command. Now, which one do you want? Do you want the thing that right now looks to be the best and the fastest but has no guarantee? Or do you want this thing that's got a lifetime guarantee? And that's what he said. I mean, is that amazing that he will go ahead and bless to the thousandth generation? But, and I look back and I think that's one of the fun things in heaven's going to be is how come my life has ended up where it was and I end up with the... And how far back does it go that God was blessing those that were faithful to him? And I don't mean by that that the Pettit family has no problem, no sin. I'm not saying that at all. I'm just saying, but they kept teaching about loving God. I just at least know the generations that I experienced from my great-grandparents to my grandparents to my parents, they all believed faithfully and they loved and tried to serve God to the best of their ability and continued to believe that there was more they could do. And I was a recipient of that. Now, Julie and I don't have kids, so the only thing I can do next to that is to accept those that will accept me and I don't in any way want anybody to call me Father Jesus even said that, but I hope as maybe a surrogate dad to some of you that didn't have dads or had the absent dads to at least be a father in the faith like Paul was to Timothy. And so in this, I wanted you to see this blessing to a thousand. Now jump on down to verse 12. Honor your father and mother so that you may live long and may live long uh, in the land the Lord your God is giving you. So he says, honor your parents and this is the promise that you can live long in the land your God's giving you and that you would have a life worth living. Now, say all that to jump back. Okay, for those of you who weren't here last week, we started this new series, Going Above to Do the Beyond or whatever it was. I don't know. It doesn't really make any difference, right? But the idea being is we know of people that go above and beyond. They're the ones that we do take the time to fill out the comment card or to do the survey after they get done talking to us. And I don't know about you all, but if I get through and talk to a live person that I can actually understand on the phone, I leave a comment, you know? Why? You care. Some of you just got that, Ugh. okay, I'll forget it. I just won't tell you about it. I thought it was really interesting. But people go above and beyond. We appreciate, right? Because they served well. And, but the whole thing is in Christianity is we go above. In other words, we that are earthlings go to the Father and because of him and what we've received from him, we're able to go beyond what we could humanly do, what's humanly possible. And yet a part of that is just experiencing God in the simplest of ways. And what I want to present to you today is I believe that this is an axiom that God is still honoring, that you love God and don't make any idols. He blesses you for generations, even way after you're dead. If you 
as a child, you honor your parents, it will go well with you. And I want you to see how that worked with this story that we started last week. Clear back here in the book of 1 Samuel. And so if you will, let's go to 1 Samuel chapter 20, or 2 Samuel, sorry. 2 Samuel chapter 9, getting ahead of myself. And real quickly, look at that strange name, this guy named Mephibosheth, and looking at David. And so chapter 9, verse 1 of 2 Samuel says, David asks, is there anyone still left in the house of Saul to whom I can show kindness for Jonathan's sake? Now, that's just a strange thing for a king to do because kings are used to people doing things for them. And David's sitting here, and it's just one of those things, like any of us, we can have a thought that runs through our mind, and we either catch that thought, and we dwell on it, or we let it pass. The sad thing is, temptations are the same way. They're thoughts. And we either let them pass, or we catch them, and we dwell on it, and then it gets into trouble. But these good thoughts, these thoughts that come from God, is he prompts things. So David had, in his mind, suddenly it was like, Jonathan, man... I made a promise to him, I want to honor it. And so he asked his servants, he said, is there anybody left to this household of Jonathan? And so there was a servant, he called for him, verse 3 then, the king asked, is there no one still left in the house of Saul to whom I can show God's kindness? So here's the king, the big guy, and instead of just taking for himself, he's saying, who can I share this with? And David was a man that was after God's own heart, meaning that he chased God, so to speak. He was in pursuit of God. And so he said, is there anyone left in this house of Saul to whom I can show God's kindness? Well, Ziba answered the king. He said, there's still a son of Jonathan. He's crippled in both feet. Now, why did he throw that in there? Well, just, you can't help but you explain. And he said, the king instantly just bypassed all that and said, well, where is he? He said, well, he's at the house of this maker, son of Amiel in Lodabar. So David had him brought from Lodabar to the house of this Amiel, or whatever, Mephibosheth was his name. Verse 6, when Mephibosheth, son of Jonathan, saw the son, or excuse me, son of Jonathan, son of Saul. So we've got two generations here, and David's reaching out to this second generation. Actually, it's three. We've got Saul, we've got Jonathan, and now we've got Mephibosheth. So David's dealing with Mephibosheth, and he said, when he saw him, I said, uh, or when Mephibosheth saw him, he bowed down to pay what to David? Honor. The same word that was used over here about children, honor your parents. Honor. The root of this word honor, and not to impress anybody, but it was just, I was kind of curious, but it has to do with pay. It is something that you, it costs. It takes your time, it takes your attention, your energy, and sometimes it takes action to honor somebody. Mephibosheth sees David, knows he's the king, knows that he was a nobody, so to speak, because he's out there in the middle of a wasteland. He was at one time a prince, but no more because David's family took over the kingdom. And so Mephibosheth has just basically lived in obscurity, and on top of that, he's got his own hardships to deal with, this struggle that he's got with these feet. And not trying to make a big deal out of that, but he's just like blown away. What's David want from me? And so he bows down and he pays him honor. David said, Mephibosheth. So he knew his name and could say it and speak it. And he reached out to him. He said, your servant. Again, he showed him honor. I'm just your servant. Because I think he was afraid. What is this king going to do to me? Don't be afraid, David said, for I'll surely show you kindness. But why? For the sake of Jonathan, for the sake of your dad, I'm going to show you kindness. Why? Because Jonathan had shown him honor as well. And David wanted to continue to honor his friendship with Jonathan. And so he's passing it on to his son. See, there's things about being honorable. One is to give honor to somebody, it's to recognize. It used to be when I was growing up, you're supposed to respect your elders. Now that I am one, I just hate it. You know, I mean, I kind of understand now why there were some that say, oh, don't call me Mr. This and that, just call me whatever. And that was what mom and dad's rule was, is that, you know, you meet somebody, you call them Mr. and Mrs. whatever it is, and uh, if they want you to call them something different, they'll tell you. Otherwise, just refer to them as Mr. or Mrs. this or that. And um, so that was something that I worked through life with, was that understanding. And yet, as you begin feeling, as granted, you say, you're feeling your oats today, and not even sure to this day what that meant, because I never felt oats. But uh, anyway, it, it was, you start getting a little bit cocky about who you are, prideful, and you begin to forget that. It's just a good principle to honor or to show respect to your elders. And so this, this idea of respect that's here, Mephibosheth understands I'm lower and he's looking to somebody that's higher and he's honoring him. 
But David's looking at him and said, no, you're not, man. You're here with me. But why did he do that? It wasn't because anything Mephibosheth had ever done or said. It was all because of something that Mephibosheth's dad had done and said. In spite of what Jonathan's dad had done and said. So if you will, let's tie this story together and go back to 1 Samuel. And I think I want to look at uh, 19. 18 is the big one we've all read and probably maybe have your page at least marked there because we all know the story about David and this big thing called Goliath. Man, you are dead this morning. What is going on? We need to stand up and do some jumping jacks. The kids didn't get you going. Um, and, and it's not that you got to perform for me or anything, but just at least give me a little bit of, let me know you're alive. I mean, Joel, I heard you. Thank you very much. You know, back in the old days when Joel was living, um, before he was really old, but uh, he was late getting to, he was really kind of late getting home one night for curfew. And so he took the shortcut, was walking, you know, and he's running, but took the shortcut through the graveyard. And man, as he's trying in such a hurry, doesn't know that they changed the graveyard because they just had dug a new grave. Because that was back clear in the days when they didn't use, you know, track hose and one thing like that to, uh, to, you know, big machinery to dig them out. They did it by hand. So they'd have to get it done ahead of time. And so, boom, he falls down in this grave and he's like, oh man, it's creeping him out. He's jumping and jumping and he finally wears out and says, man, I just will sit here. Surely by morning somebody will come here. I hope before they lower the casket in. And so he's sitting there. Well, there's somebody else in the meantime that came along behind him and they're going through the same thing and they fall in. And they tried the same thing. Oh, God, help me and one thing like that. And finally they sat down and said, there's no use, buddy. There's no way to get out of here. Boom, he jumped out of there as soon as Joel said that because he was motivated. You got the idea? I'm not staying in here with somebody. Had nothing to do with this. Just thought I'd throw it out there because, man, you need something here. So, okay, now we're back here. David and Goliath. We're going to pass off David and Goliath. Let's go to this other one. So David makes Saul famous because this, the Philistine army had always been beating him up, and they were at a stalemate with this big giant of an ogre of a man. And David whips him, and the guys come around, and they rally, and they come back, and they celebrate. The whole town comes out, ticker tape parade. Chapter 19, Saul told his son Jesse, or Jonathan, excuse me, and all the attendants to kill David. Why? Because Saul wasn't an honorable man. His pride was jealous of David. And so now it's, it's just irritating him. All the people are singing about Saul, or David and all that he's done. So he told his son, Jonathan, and all the attendants to kill David. But Jonathan was very fond of David, and he warned him. He said, my father, Saul's looking for a chance to kill you. Be on your guard tomorrow morning. Go in hiding and stay there. I'll go out and stand with my father in the field where you are, and I'll speak to him about you, and we'll tell you what I find out. Well, Jonathan spoke well of David to Saul, his father, and said to him, Let's not, uh, let not the king do wrong to his servant David. He's not wronged you. So he speaks logic to his dad respectfully. But he said, man, let's look at the, the facts here. He's not wronged you. And what he has done has benefited you greatly. He took his life in his hand when he killed the Philistine. The Lord won a great victory for all of Israel. So he eventually points it, and it was really all of God, because we're God's people. He said, man, look, the Lord won a great victory for all of Israel, and you saw it, and you were glad. Why then would you do wrong to an innocent man like David by killing him for no reason? Saul listened. So the dad listened to his son, and he took an oath, made an agreement. As surely as the Lord lives, David will not be put to death. So Jonathan calls David, told him the whole conversation. He brought him to Saul, and David was Saul as before. Then once more war broke out, David went out, fought the Philistines. He struck them with such force that they fled before him. But an evil spirit from the Lord, and this is an interesting phrase here, came upon Saul who was sitting in his house with a spear in his hand. And while David was playing the harp, Saul tried to pin him to the wall with a spear. But David, like Keanu Reeves in the movie, evaded that. I mean, he eluded it. And uh, the spear went going into the wall. And that night, David decided he better just get out of here, you know. Now, first of all, we've got an evil spirit. People like to say, ah, those don't exist. You leave them alone, they'll leave you alone. No, they won't. No, they won't. They're real, and they're really effective, and especially on people that don't believe in them. And I don't believe that God sent an evil spirit because we've got plenty of scriptures backing up otherwise that they're only good and perfect gifts come from above. God doesn't do evil. He doesn't tempt anybody to do so. So he's not going to send in the sense of, all right, I'm going to give you an evil spirit. But what it is, is that when we walk away from God and we fail to honor God, we fail to honor God's word or our word that we made, 
Because you know that? The scriptures over and over talk about finding good and fulfilling your commitments. If you said you'd do it, do it, no matter what it costs you. My dad and granddad reinforced that to me. If you make a deal, no matter what it costs, you stick with that deal. If they don't come through on their end, that's their problem, but you're going to come through on yours. Why? That was called honor and being honorable. Well, in this, Saul had made a commitment to his son, number one, but he would made a commitment to God who called him to be king. And as he's doing it, Saul gets in this mindset more and more and more of doing it his way. Earlier, you could go back and read in the history of 1 Samuel there, that Samuel finally gave up on him because he kept doing things his way instead of God's way. He wasn't patient. He wouldn't wait. And so what happens is it's like I believe that we're actually all born with a grace that's around us or evil spirits would just jump inside of us right then and there. Might be kind of far-fetched out there, not trying to you know, make any of you think there's no snakes under the stage up here. I'm not going to cast any evil spirits today. That's not my plan, anything or whatever. But to ignore them is ridiculous. But what happens is we've got the grace of God. As we go through life, we determine whether we stay in that grace or we begin doing things on our own and shoving God away. Then you're on your own. And spirits can easily enter you. Your call. And I think that that's what happened here with Saul, that he persisted. And instead of honoring God and honoring his commitments, he persisted in doing whatever he felt. And so he became this individual that went totally off of his feelings instead of being one that was thoughtful and would go off of conviction. And so dads today, I want to encourage you, model for your kids and for the rest of the world, in fact, the same thing, that you have convictions. You don't just blow in the wind. It's not just whatever you feel like. You don't care what the world says or what's legal today. You go off of what you know is right in spite of what's okay. And the reason being is, is to honor God. And it's also to be an honorable person. But this evil spirit comes, and now he's in sight, and Saul can't do anything but dwell on just, man, this, this stupid kid, why did I ever let him fight Goliath? Because he's ruined my life. And so he just chucks a spear at him, man, and it sticks in the wall. And David goes, exit stage right, time to leave. This isn't a good place to be. Now, if I'm David and not operating in the spirit of God and not being a man after God's own heart, what am I going to do? I'll grab that stinking spear and throw it right back at him, right? You try to do this to me, let me show you, dude. I took down Goliath. You're not near as big as he is. But David didn't. He left the spear and left the room. Why? It was honorable. Multiple times throughout David's ministry, he had the chance to kill Saul. He didn't. You know what he said? I will not touch the Lord's anointed one. That's conviction and it's honor. Honor to even an unhonorable or dishonorable man, it's honor. And he did it because of his faith in God. You see that order again? God up here, his word, then you or your parents, and then you, and then your wife, and then your kids. Man, when you go to the top, you stick with that, it becomes this shield, this umbrella that covers your family. And it's amazing the strength that comes from that, not just the strength, the feeling of security and protection. My dad disciplined us, and you've heard the stories about that. And some of you probably say, I'm glad he wasn't my dad. I couldn't be more thrilled that I had the dad I had. I'm not going to say my dad's better than your dad, but he is. And, you know, he, he's not necessarily bigger, but he was the best. He's still 80 years old, and I wouldn't wrestle him. Why? One, I don't ever want to fight with him. Two, I still believe he's strong. But because of his strength in honor and respect to my mom, to his dad, to other people, to his word, to paying bills, that he, if you sign up for it, you pay it. But you see, today it's all about, let's talk to the politicians. They're all saying, we'll just forgive all your bills. How's that honorable? And what about those poor stupid people that we paid ours? How does that fit in? And I'm just saying, you know, somewhere along the line, you got to decide who you are. But quit following the world. Follow God. If you want to have a life that it will go well with you and for a thousand generations past you. And so I encourage you, man. I mean, like I said, my dad disciplined us, but I never felt scared when my dad was beside me. I didn't like the thunder and lightning because I was on the top bunk at the top of the house. 
But I'd remind myself and pray to God. But I knew one thing. If I called Dad, he'd come up and he'd tell me, son, it'll be okay. And he wouldn't be on getting in bed with me to show me it'd be okay. Now, that was not when I was 17 or 18. That was when I was a lot younger than that, you know. But, but my point being is what? When you begin to understand God's strength and his discipline is for your benefit and it also ripple effect benefits the others, why wouldn't you honor God? And the whole thing is when you're honoring God, you know one thing you've absolutely positively got is his protection. David didn't, didn't just dodge the spear. God alerted him to see what was happening, how it was going, and he was able to bob and weave or whatever it was. It missed him entirely. Why? It wasn't David's time to die. God's going to protect him because David honored God. And David continued to honor God by not getting even with Saul. Now, what I want you to see in the midst of it then is here's Jonathan. So we got the king. We got the king's son, which is the prince. And here Jonathan is going, wait a minute, man. I find David very respectful. I like David. I love David as a brother, as a friend. And I want to love my dad, but dad, this just didn't write what you're doing. But when he sees that dad doesn't honor the very commitment he made to his own son. And I want you to get a peek at this, dads, because this is crucial. And I'm not saying that you failed altogether if you didn't. But if you've ever told your kid you would do something and didn't do it, at least be man enough to go back to him and say, I owe you an apology and I'm going to do what I can to make this right. Because I told you I would and I didn't. And that's the way it is with imperfect people. I don't like Christianity that just sweeps our errors under the rug and says, oh, well, I got grace. I think it's important that we owe up, own up to what we've done or said that we, or where we failed. To everybody, no, but to whoever it was directly involved with it. Why? Because that's honorable too. And I'll never forget the first time my dad ever came to me and apologized he said, I'm not going to apologize for disciplining you, but I must ask your forgiveness because I disciplined you with emotion. I should have waited. What'd that tell me? That's a big man. He even admitted he was wrong. Now, he couldn't take the spanking back. It'd been nice, but he couldn't. He didn't have to. He shared with and man, that's, that's, that's the greatest thing I can give you guys as dads, is that you can leave impressions with your kids. Some of you are regretting today's hard for you because you weren't a good dad. You weren't a godly man. You weren't a Christian when your kids were growing up. All I can tell you is be honorable now and tell them what's changed. I'm sorry. I'm sorry that I didn't lead you how to pray. I'm sorry, I didn't pray more. I'm sorry, I didn't know the Lord. I'm sorry, I didn't share the scriptures with you so you could make up your mind of who you believe God is. Because you see, when we don't tell them from the word who God is, they're left to believe whatever they want to believe. And so we create these designer gods that aren't the real thing. And then we think we can count on a designer heaven that our designer God's going to give us because there's a heaven there someplace. And I'm not saying it's bad if that's all you know. I'm just saying, what a shame when they can know more. And you see, that's what the church is about. And I don't mean just our church. But the church is about sinners that have been saved. But we're not just saved and we go around flaunting it, pretending like, man, my stuff doesn't stink. We're saved and we go back and we understand that we need to account for certain things. That first of all, we do to God, we confess our sins. And we also confess that we believe Jesus is Lord. That we go back to the people we've wronged and say, man... When I wasn't living with Christ, I didn't even realize. I took this and thought, oh, well, they deserve it. I'm sorry. If you've got somebody in your life that you got even with one time and you didn't do it in the right way, but you did it out of vengeance, you need to go back and tell them. But like I said, the greatest thing that any dad can do is go back and tell your kids. Sad thing is some won't listen. That's okay. You can still tell them. Write them in a note. I still believe in letters. I mean, I use email and I use text and stuff that way, and I communicate with my dad a great deal that way and my mom. But you know what's cool about letters? People tend to hold on to them. And they'll go back and read them again and again. This book is made up of what? Letters. 
And we go back and read them and we see new things. And, you know, the great thing is letters last way beyond the physical life. I've started saving mom and dad's voicemails to me because of some of you that have lost your loved one. I want to have that because, you see, by Julie and I being down here, we're far enough away. We don't see our parents every day. We don't see them but once, maybe twice a year. So it's a voice relationship. It's kind of like prayer. And so I've started saving because I know there's coming a day when, unless I go first, and that's a great possibility, um, but so that if my dad or my mom's gone, I can hear their voice again. And it's funny, as I go back and I listen to someone, because every once in a while I go to clean up my voicemails, you know, because Julia, I'll tell you, I don't throw things away very quick. But uh, as I go to clean it out, I'll listen to them. They're still alive, and I'll still listen to the voicemails. I cannot impress upon you dads enough how much your voice can convey. Love, conviction, encouragement, correction. My dad to this day will still say, I think you better think about that again. I'll be telling him, stop and think about that. I don't have to. I'm on my own now. I still honor him because he's never told me something intentionally wrong. And so I want to encourage you that we can begin a new generation of dads, starting with you, wherever you're at, whatever age you are, you can change it. You can stop the curse and you can begin the blessings. Jonathan put a stop to the curse. His dad turned away from God. He became in infuriated with things, angry all the time, hard to soothe, jealous, one thing and I like that. And that's the amazing thing about sin is it just magnifies and you become a magnet for it and it just turns around and starts working in you. Jonathan's going, Dad, that's not right. And his dad says, oh, I'll never do it then. And then he turns around and does it again. So real quickly, as quickly as I can at least, I want you to read here with verse chapter 20, excuse me, jumping on up. So David and Jonathan talk. They made this promise. I guess I do need to go back to that, okay? Because, uh, well, you can read it. You probably already have, and uh, so I won't. I'll go back. But they made this promise to each other, and that's what's important about it's a contract. Although verbal, it makes no difference if it's written down. It's no different than it is with the bank. It's no different than it is with a car dealership or whatever you do. If you sign a promissory thing, then you're saying, I covenant with you to do this and follow through with it. And so... David, Jonathan, you know, swore to David. He said, man, I'll take care of you. I'll look out after you. I don't want my dad to kill you. David turned around and said to Jonathan, man, I'll look after you and your family. And Jonathan goes, I want to know that. You'll take care of my family? And David said, yes, I will. And obviously you can see the rest of the story, but let's read chapter 20 here. David fled from Naoth to Ramah and went from, to Jonathan and they asked, he said, what have I done? What's my crime? In other words, how come your dad's still coming after me? He said, what have I done? What's my crime? How have I wronged your father that he's trying to take my life? David's just trying to say, if I've done something wrong, show me here, Jonathan. You know, he said, I don't understand this. But David took an oath and said, your father knows very well that I have found favor in your eyes. And he has said to himself, Jonathan must not know this or he'll be grieved. Yet as surely as the Lord lives and as you live, there's only a step between me and death. Jonathan said to David, whatever you want me to do, I'll do for you. So David said, look, tomorrow's a new moon festival. And he goes into all this thing, and there's this, this deal at the new moon. They would always have this whole thing where all the king's men would come together, and they'd eat, okay? David said, I should be there, but I'm not going to be. And if your dad asks, tell him David went to make sacrifices with his family. But if he's mad, then you'll know he's still coming after me. And so it's a very simple type thing, but here Jonathan is stuck in the middle, a clown to the left me, jokes to the right. Uh, yeah, he's stuck in the middle. But he looks to see what's honorable. And he believed at this time that even though this was his dad, he couldn't honor what his dad was doing because it didn't line up with God. But David, on the other hand, did not take vengeance in his hand, wouldn't kill his dad, was just trying to say, hey, man, it's just not that time. I'm going to get out of here. 
And so Jonathan had, you know, covenanted with him, made an agreement, made a promise. He said, I'll feel my dad out and see what's up. So they made this arrangement where they'd go and shoot arrows and all this stuff and the boy. And anyway, what happened was, sure enough, the first day he didn't say anything. Second day, Saul was angry. Where's David? And turned around and then he's ready to jump all over him and he'd go out and kill him and go after him and everything like that. So Jonathan goes out, shoots the arrow, and he sends one far away and sends a little boy in that was getting his arrows back for him. And wouldn't that be the coolest thing to be? I'd love archery if somebody would go get my arrows and bring it back, you know. I guess you can do that when you're the prince. But uh, anyway, Jonathan walked over to David, and that's where I want to kind of pick this up with, if I can find it here. Um, Verse 24, so David hid in the field. When the new moon festival came, the king sat down to eat. He sat in his customary place by the wall opposite Jonathan. Abner was next to Saul, but David's place was empty. Saul said nothing that day, for he thought something must have happened to David, make him ceremonially unclean. Surely he is unclean. The next day, the second day of the month, David's place was empty again. And Saul said to his son, why hasn't the son of Jesse come to the meal either yesterday or today? Jonathan, Jonathan answered. David earnestly asked for permission to go to Bethlehem. He said, let me go because our family is observing a sacrifice in the town. My brothers ordered me to be there. I found, if I found favor in your eyes, let me get away to see my brothers. That's why he's not come to the king's table. Saul's anger flared up at Jonathan. He said to him, you son of a perverse and rebellious woman. See, it's always the wife's fault when the kid's not good, you know. You son of a perverse and rebellious woman. I dare you to use that one. But uh, don't I know that you have sided with the son of Jesse to your own shame and to the shame of your mother who bore you? As long as the son of Jesse lives on this earth, neither you nor the kingdom will be established. In other words, saying, don't you care? Don't you want to be king? If he's alive, you won't be. Now send and bring him to me, for he must die. Jonathan appeals. He said, why should he be put to death? What's he done? Saul hurled his spear at him to kill him. You read that with me? Then Jonathan knew that his father intended to kill David. I'd guess if dad's willing to kill his son, he really means it about killing David. So then they go out to this field and meet. Now, down to verse 41. After the boy had gone, David got up from the south side of the stone, bowed down before Jonathan three times. What's that show? Honor. He's still recognizing your dad's a king, you're his son. He bows down three times before him with his face to the ground. Then they kissed each other and they wept together, but David wept the most. And Jonathan said to David, Go in peace, for we have sworn friendship with each other in the name of the Lord, saying, The Lord is witness between you and me, between your descendants and my descendants, for how long? Forever. And David left, and Jonathan went back to town. And it goes on from there. It's quite a, just a great novel of that, but it's historically about this life of David, the one that God called and anointed as shepherd boy while Saul was still king, the one that killed Goliath and all this other stuff that gets messed up and lost in this. And so here he is, established in king. John, Saul was killed. Jonathan was killed. And on the same day they were both killed, the nursemaid that was carrying the five-year-old Mephibosheth in a hurry to get out and to protect themselves because they thought they are coming after the kingdom, she fell down, and that was when Jonathan's feet became crippled. And we don't know how many years have passed, but Jonathan is now, a, or Mephibosheth is now a man. But this third generation, second generation of honor is content with life or at least assuming whatever it is, a very menial life, stuck out in the middle of nowhere. And a servant comes and carries him back to the palace. When he sees David, he bows down and honors him. David says, get up and don't be afraid, man. Because of your dad, I'm here tell you I want you to eat at the table with me I want you to know I'd be honored to have you at my guest every meal we have that's honor and I want you to see and connect the dots here because it's just like God promised it will go well with you now it didn't suddenly erase and make everything good and Mephibosheth it wasn't that he didn't wish he had his dad back It wasn't that David didn't wish he did, but they've gone on. What can they do with what they've got? And he says, the least I can do for you, you because of your dad and his love, his relationship, his his commitment to me, I'm staying committed to him, and I want you to know I honor you. But he didn't try to make it, I don't honor you, I'm just honoring God. No, I want you to sit at the table with me. 
And then what I want you to see in all this is, is folks, this thing of honor, this thing of honoring God, this thing of honoring people, your parents, it's not because it pays off right now. But it's like what I've learned, and it pays off for me when I'm 60 and my dad's now 80. It pays off now. It pays off when either one of us die because we honored each other while we were alive. It pays off now because it lets me talk to my nieces and nephews that aren't my own children, but in a way that I can instruct them and encourage them to understand grandma and grandpa. And that some of the things they may ask of you seems archaic, and it's not the way our world does it, but they're concerned about your well-being. And can you tell me what your life would have been like if my dad didn't believe enough to live his Christianity out loud. Because now when we get together at Thanksgiving, there's nearly 50 of us, direct descendants of mom and dad. 50. It's not that I'm touting our families being, oh, the most God. It's not that. It's just God will honor all that you give him. But he can't honor the unhonorable. David showed this tremendous integrity of heart by instead of sitting in the lap of luxury, he thought, who else can I bless? If we are people with a heart after God's, wouldn't we be the same way? Who can I bless? Who can I bless? And Paul also wrote, the one that wrote about children obey the parents when he's writing to the church about how to grow up in the Lord, he said, man, I want to tell you as Christians, we've got this opportunity. Not only in light of God and his, his great sacrifice in view of his mercy, should you be living sacrifices. But let me tell you what, living sacrifices, blessed, they don't have to curse. Not only the words that we share curse words that way, not only do we not need to do that, we don't need to ever slander somebody else. But we can bless them. That's the power of honor. And we don't do it because we're so great. We do it because of how great our God is. And we do it because God loves when his people benefit those that seem insignificant. Because to God, they're not. And we're showing honor to him when we give even the lowest of people in our eyes the greatest of honor in our hearts. When we pray for each other instead of withholding prayers, when we bless instead of curse, when we love instead of hate. And so on this Father's Day, man, may we go above and beyond. Might each of you today, as we have this invitation time, as Kale comes up to lead us in this good, good Father again, unless you change that, is that the plan still? Okay. Um, I want to encourage you. I want to encourage you, man. I'll tell you what, if my dad was here, I'd go back and get him and say, can I pray a blessing over you as you've blessed me? I'm not trying to put it on the spot. I'm not trying to make any of you parents that your kids don't come back and get you feel bad. It's just, why do we wait till funerals to oftentimes say all those things that we thought? And what a great way to bless today just to come up and to pray. Or parents, or dads, especially today. If you look back, and some of you moms have had to be dads. If you look back and you see something you want to share with your kids, why don't you bring them up and share with them and pray a blessing over them? Confess to them if you've realized, man, I goofed up. I wish I'd have done this or hadn't done that. And I mean, that's what this time is about. It's about taking what we believe in the depths of our heart and expressing it, right? Or we can be expressionless and do nothing. And just sit there and have good, warm thoughts. Or we can just keep sleeping. Or we can wish somebody turned turn the thermostat up or somebody else wishes they'd turn it down. Man, I just say, do something eternal today. It's your time. It's your life. Will you stand with me and respond?